Once again, thank you for joining. Uh, you are on the webinar today about the North Bay Community Resilience Initiative, the path to energy resilience and sustainability. We have John Sarter and Melanie Cannon with uh, Clean Coalition presenting. Just want to go over a few technical functions of GoToWebinar. Uh, the webinar recording and slides will be sent to all registered attendees within two business days, so you'll have it by the weekend if uh, you need to drop off or if you haven't attended this webinar, uh, you'll be able to download uh, those presentations in PDF or PowerPoint formats. Uh, all of our webinars are archived on our uh, website, clean-coalition.org and on our YouTube channel. Uh, we have a brand new website, so the, the webinars uh, uh, from, from all the way back to uh, a number of years, um, are on our website to view. Uh, if you have a question, we will be having a Q&A at the end of the webinar uh, for Malini and John to field some questions. Uh, if you go into the GoToWebinar control panel, you can type in your question and we will try to get to, the, to, uh, to answering it. Uh, if we run out of time, uh, we'll be sure to follow up with you uh, via email. And if you have any other questions about uh, this webinar or future webinars, please let me know. Again, my name is Josh, and my email is listed on the slide there, josh at clean-coalition.org. So today's presenters, John Sarter. He's a program manager at the Clean Coalition. John is a sustainable designer and developer, innovator in systems integration, and expert in real estate, renewable energy, and transportation. He has owned and operated his firm, Sarter Construction and Design, Off the Grid Design, and Solux Alpha since 1986. John's a recognized leader in the solar plus storage space since 2008. And he founded the Microgrid Development Group in San Francisco in 2014 to unite a consortium, consortium of technology, technology, energy, engineering, and other professionals committed to creating a resilient and sustainable 100% renewable energy future. Malini Kanan, a program engineer at Clean Coalition, leads technical activities of Clean Coalition's Community Microgrid Initiative. She has helped communities across California, New York metropolitan area, and Puerto Rico design and develop community microgrids through scoping, planning, and engineering design and analysis work. Previously, as a research engineer at the Schatz Energy Research Center, Malini tested and analyzed performance data from small-scale solar, battery, and LED consumer electronics as a consultant for the World Bank. So now, I am going to uh, switch it over to John for uh, their presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the North Bay Community Resilience Web webinar. Um, this initiative is also known as the NBCRI. I'm John Sarter and I'm the Clean Coalition's Program Manager for the NBCRI. Um, Josh told you a little bit about my background, which is great. I appreciate that. Um, this webinar is going to be the first in a series of four in which we'll take deeper dives into the main goals and topics within this first introductory webinar. Sorry. Um, Josh, my presentation went away. Uh, yeah, John, if you can just uh, just just click on the PowerPoint uh, logo, you probably will bring it right up. PowerPoint logo, where? Yeah, if you go down to your uh, your your uh, your icon, PowerPoint should be right there. Well, on my, it didn't come up, so. That's the wrong one. It was there a minute ago. Okay. Sorry about this, folks. I'm kind of new to this go-to webinar system, so I will get this squared away here. There we go. Okay. So the Clean Coalition is a nonprofit organization that's focused on accelerating the transition to renewable energy and a modern grid through technical policy and project development expertise. The catastrophic fires of 2017 and 2018 and the associated loss of lives, homes, and even entire communities makes it 
very clear that we need to adapt to a new danger that now faces us all and find ways to adapt which are more resilient. These tragic wildfires were not anomalies. They more likely represent the new abnormal as stated by former Governor Jerry Brown. It's important for us to recognize this unfortunate reality and adapt to it by changing the way we design, build, and power our communities. These are the primary goals of the, and objectives of the NBCRI, to help impacted communities rebuild with greater efficiency, decarbonize, and enhance resilience, to encourage all new developments to do the same, and to create healthy, safe, and resilient communities. It's very important to do this work while we're rebuilding as it's most cost-effective cost to do it then, and it could be more easily financed into the projects, thereby reducing the cost impacts and upgrades to a resilient, safer, and sustainable community development model. These extreme events are not isolated to the North Bay. Extreme weather events are occurring all over the nation and globally. This slide was developed by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association Administration, sorry, and represents the cost of these extreme events in the USA alone. Severe weather is the leading cause of power outages in the US. The aging of our grid, much of which was constructed over a period beginning more than 100 years ago, has made Americans more susceptible to outages and damages caused by severe weather and also vulnerable to outside influences such as hacking and solar or man-made electromagnetic magnetic imp, uh, pulses known as EMPs. So what is power system resilience? Resilience, resilience encompasses consequences to the electricity system and other critical infrastructure from increasingly likely high impact external events. Resilience is additive to reliability. Extreme events will inevitably cause outages and reliability focuses on investing in infrastructure that can reduce outage duration, cost, and impact on critical services. A resilient grid may go down for some time, but it can preserve or prioritize, prioritize restoration of services for critical customers like hospitals, water and sanitation systems, first responders, communication towers, and food and medical storage facilities. In order to cope with increased wildfire risk in their service territory, PG&E and other IOUs have implemented Public Safety Power Shutoff Program, which affects some communities in the North Bay region. During high wind and low humidity conditions, PG&E will shut down certain at-risk power lines. Senate Bill 901 opened a proceeding at the CPUC, which will investigate solutions to mitigate wildfire risk, including power shutdowns to avoid sparking wildfires in high-risk conditions. Based on recent community workshops with PG&E, there were multiple PSPS events planned in 2018. And they are expected to be more frequent moving forward with outages lasting from three to five days, up to three to five days. Last year, PG&E brought in mobile diesel generators to provide neighborhoods with power during the PSPSs, but PG&E will not provide this service long-term and diesel generation requires continued fuel supply and is also very greenhouse gas intense. The major negative impact of these long duration power outages is that on critical facilities, businesses and residents lose power and cannot provide or receive critical services. The solution we propose to solve these problems for the long term is a resilient and highly sustainable method. The main goals of the NBCRI are to track, promote, and publicize cutting edge resilience related efficiency and electrification incentives and policy advancement by government agencies, to procure and develop a database of model structures with community microgrid ready designs, and these will be new and retrofit for residential, commercial, and municipal buildings, to develop community microgrid roadmap and stage pilot product projects beginning with critical facility microgrids such as fire stations, hospitals, and places of refuge. To position these pilots in areas that are conducive to expansion in community microgrids, ideally at pre-installed interconnection hub locations identified by PG&E. This slide shows some of the main collaborators in the working group within the NBCRI. We have bi-monthly calls to expand upon and discuss topics and strategies directed at the main goals of the initiative. One goal is to support the advanced energy rebuild programs being offered by the local CCAs, Sonoma Clean Power, 
or SCP as, a, as they're also known, and MCE. CCA stands for Community Choice Aggregation. CCAs enable local control by communities or regions to choose where they procure energy for their communities. Much of this energy can be generated by local distributed, distributed energy resources, also known as DERs. The program being offered by SCP and MCE encourage the local generation of renewable energy. Sonoma Clean Power, MCE, pg and &E, and the Bay Area Air Quality Management District have combined efforts to help develop two very similar programs in the North Bay. Both are slightly differing versions of the Advanced Energy Rebuild Program. The Sonoma Clean Power Program has two pathways to qualify through. The prescriptive path specifies certain required elements. The flexible path requires that projects be 20% above current efficiency codes, also known as Title 24, for roofs to be engineered for solar panels at a minimum, and for installation of a free EV charger provided by Sonoma Clean Power. The total incentive amount is $17,500 for developing an all-electric home with solar and energy storage. This can be enough money to completely offset the cost of going all electric in the rebuilding process. The MCE Advanced Energy Rebuild NAPA program utilizes a flexible path similar to the SCP program, which is 20% above current Title 24 efficiency codes. Then it provides rebates for specific qualified upgrades. The maximum incentive for the MCE program is $12,500. Another goal of the NBCRI is to develop a model structure database. This part of the initiative aims to develop a database of replicable home and building plans which are highly efficient, fully decarbonized by being all electric and solar plus energy storage enabled, and also community microgrid ready. The model structures are grid optimal by being light on the grid by virtue of being very energy efficient and being solar plus energy storage enabled. This, the, this makes them islandable buildings and campus microgrids, which adds layers of resilience to a community by having no single point of failure within that community. They have grid integrated electric infrastructure. These include appliances which can take up excess renewable energy as it's generated from the grid and energy storage systems and electric vehicle chargers which can charge with that excess energy as well. Soon these these energy storage systems and electric vehicles will also be bi-directional, which means they can give that energy back to the home and to the grid as a service and potentially for revenue. The model structures are designed to interconnect into the community microgrids as prosumers. And a prosumer is a customer that both produces and consumes energy. They also incorporate the elements from the electrification and community microgrid ready document, which is also called the ECMR document, the Clean Coalition developed this with other microgrid industry experts, and the document is designed as a guideline and template for helping electrical engineers, installers, and owners understand how easy and cost-effective it is to make a home fully electric and microgrid ready. There's a perception in the industry that advanced energy buildings are difficult and much more expensive to build, but the reality is that the upfront costs are not that great, and in the long run, they actually can save a great deal of money. We're developing the model structures database to help the community develop more resilient buildings and systems that are partners with the grid. These are some of the team members that we are collaborating with for the model structure program within the NBCRI. We're partnering with these organizations, organizations that are focused on the highest efficiencies in the built environment, as well as organizations and firms that are focused on reducing the time and cost of building and rebuilding with resilience. Solux Alpha was developed by uh, um, my private firm, Off the Grid Design, in San Francisco recently. It's one example of a model structure in the category of multifamily buildings. Solux Alpha is a six-story, four-unit building that's currently generating approximately twice as much energy as the building uses. This allows for each residence to have over 15,000 miles of EV driving generated by the PV solar on the site only. This makes the building a zero carbon living and transportation system. 
Many such buildings within a community could export and share this energy to power other aspects and infrastructure within the community, such as other electric mobility services to share within the community. These can include e-scooters, e-bikes, electric cars, and even electric buses, potentially. Solux Elf is the first passive house certified multi-unit microgrid building to the US marketplace. We use passive house methodology as a baseline for energy reduction, and this results in an 80% savings on heating and cooling energy. The building is all electric and it's fossil fuel free, and it won the 2018 US Department of Energy's Housing Innovation Award and the 2018 Passive House Institute US Best Overall Project in North America. The building has five independent microgrid systems, and each system has 21 Supreme GXB 380 watt solar panels, which are bifacial and can generate up to 475 watts due to that bifacial effect. This means there are solar cells on the bottom side of the panel as well as the top, so reflected and ambient light create the bifacial boost in the panels. We have three Tesla Powerwall batteries for each unit, or energy storage system, or ESS as, as they're known. These three batteries, batteries create triple redundancy, meaning there's no single point of failure. Again, if one battery goes offline, the other two remain functional. The common area has two blue ion batteries from Blue Planet Energy of Hawaii. The energy from these two towers is combined through three Schneider inverters to create three phase power for the elevator and common areas. We also included vehicle to building or V2B electrical transfer, and that's designed to use your vehicle as a battery for the homes. And there's enough energy in a Tesla Model S, for instance, to power one of these units for up to a week. So it really enables a tremendous amount of uh, additional energy storage and flexibility. These photos are from a case study we developed on the first residence that was rebuilt in, in Sonoma after the 2017 fires, utilizing the full Sonoma Clean Power Advanced Energy Rebuild Incentive Package and it included solar and energy storage. The addition of energy storage to the solar panels means the Hirsch residents will have priority loads such as refrigerators, lighting, heating and air conditioning, and level one EV charging powered when the grid is disabled or shut off due to high wildfire danger. Some of the many benefits to homeowners and occupants of these types of model structures are lower operation costs, so near zero energy bills, excess energy export, and potentially even HOA dividends in a multi-unit building. The electric vehicles can be powered by renewable energy that's on the premises. You end up with a better, um, healthier building that increases occupant health and can logically lead to reduced medical costs and perhaps even greater longevity. The home becomes a community asset and also a grid asset. All these benefits combine to lead to higher appraised property values. The third goal of the NBCRI is to stage pilot projects, beginning with critical facility microgrids. Critical facilities can include places like municipal buildings that provide critical services to the community. Some examples of, are the Office of Emergency Services, Emergency Operations Centers, Fire and Police Departments, water treatment plants, et cetera. Critical facilities can also include hospitals, clinics, senior centers, and places of refuge that can serve as emergency shelters, community centers, and schools, et cetera. There are a number of critical facility microgrids that are now operational. The city of Fremont has installed microgrids at some of their fire stations for resilience and backup power and to lower their energy bills. And Kaiser Permanente has a microgrid at their Richmond facility. Amalini is going to take over for a little bit and talk more about critical facility microgrid projects and other microgrids. Take it away, Mal. Great. Thank you, John. Um, so to reiterate what John just mentioned, uh, the third goal of the North Bay Community Resilience Initiative is to develop a roadmap for community microgrids. And for us here in the North Bay, a logical place to start is with critical facility microgrids. 
So first off, why do we need microgrids? What you see here is a map from provided by the California Public Utilities Commission that shows the San Francisco Bay Area as well as counties north of that, including Marin, Sonoma, and Napa counties. The red regions on the map represent extreme fire threat zones, and the gold color represents elevated fire threat zones. As John mentioned earlier, during a public safety power shutoff, PG&E can shut off power to the red zones and possibly the yellow zones as well. And these conversations are ongoing at the CPUC. Microgrids provide a solution that allow critical facilities and eventually entire communities to have emergency backup power and resilience, which would be especially significant in these zones. So what is a microgrid? A microgrid is a group of interconnected loads and distributed energy resources within a clearly defined electrical boundary that can act as a single controllable load with respect to the grid. A microgrid can connect and disconnect from the grid to enable it to operate in both grid connected and grid island mode. This definition is from the US Department of Energy. Microgrid is an umbrella term that incorporates a variety of scopes, scales, and use cases. For example, you could have a building level microgrid, you could have a community or campus level microgrid, and you could have a microgrid that spans an entire substation grid area. A microgrid can provide cost savings due to the low cost of solar these days, but it can also be a more expensive source of energy than purchasing directly from PG&E or your local CCA. For right now, the economics of microgrids are quite project specific due to costs related to interconnection and infrastructure upgrades. Facility microgrids focus on a single customer. What you can see here is a graphic that describes really the entirety of our power system today. A facility or building level microgrid uh, can include equipment such as solar, batteries, et cetera, on a single customer site. Many commercial and industrial facilities can realize cost savings from on-site microgrids and have the ability to island from the grid during grid outages. However, the benefits of these microgrids are typically limited to that customer or business. By siting facility microgrids on community critical facilities, such as police stations, fire stations, hospitals, emergency shelters, etc., you can start to move the margin on who these facility microgrids actually benefit. But as I mentioned earlier, the real goal of or this goal as part of the NBCRI is to develop a long-term pathway or roadmap to community microgrids. Community microgrids can serve up to thousands of customers. They consist of many different players, including commercial and industrial businesses, residences, as well as the distribution system operator. Because community microgrids can benefit so many different parties, it's really essential to the long-term vision of resilient communities. In a community microgrid, the local loads can include homes, businesses, and critical facilities. The local resources can include rooftop solar, battery energy storage, as well as larger resources such as geothermal, electricity generation, wind energy, etc. While it is possible to utilize diesel generators and or natural gas generators or fuel cells to provide resilience in a community microgrid, the fact of the matter is that a fossil fuel is essentially limited. Often you're limited by the amount that you can transport during an emergency. And in addition, um, in California, one of the greatest threats we're facing is the next big earthquake. And various studies show that in the event of a large-scale earthquake, gas infrastructure is likely to fail. 
And then you end up with a natural gas powered generator or fuel cell that is actually no longer resilient. So this slide has a definition of the community microgrid. Um, a community microgrid is essentially a modern approach for designing and operating the electric grid staged with renewables and stage for resilience. A community microgrid can island from the grid. It has components, primarily distributed energy resources such as solar energy and st energy storage, um, but it can also include other equipment such as monitoring communications and control equipment and systems as well as demand response. They are an opportunity to deploy distributed energy resources that are clean and local. They're resilient and are able to provide ongoing renewables driven backup power for critical and prioritized loads and eventually serve all community energy needs. And they're also replicable. They're a solution that can be readily extended and replicated throughout any utility service territory. The benefits of a community microgrid are fourfold, um, and they provide benefits that are not provided by today's centralized energy system. They enable lower costs and increased economic investment. They improve overall performance in terms of power quality, reliability, and resilience. They provide resilience and security. And finally, it's a replicable, scalable model. The indefinite renewables driven backup power provides an unparalleled trifecta of environmental, economic, and resilience benefits. Some more specific benefits of community microgrids are that they provide reliability and power continuity, resilience and safety. Uh, they're a source of local renewable energy that can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, provide local control of energy, enable electric vehicle charging infrastructure, which has been challenging for many municipalities. And finally, they reduce transmission losses due to having a local source of energy. Community microgrids can also enable local jobs in engineering, construction, and maintenance. They enable participation by multiple parties through a network of prosumers who share the use generation and revenue of and from energy. And finally, they enable energy security and national security by reducing dependence on foreign sources of fuel. So there are a few challenges and opportunities to kind of change the regulatory landscape to enable community microgrids. First and foremost, wholesale distributed generation is a largely underutilized market segment. Um, here in California, we see a lot of behind the meter retail side solar, um, and we also see a lot of utility scale solar. However, wholesale DG is kind of that central sweet spot where you can deploy 500 kW up to you know 10 or so megawatts of solar on rooftops, parking lots, and parking garages. And the real benefit is that the solar is located where the load is located, and that reduces transmission losses um, and also reduces the need for certain grid infrastructure. This is largely an underutilized market segment in California. However, Clean Coalition is working to improve this going forward. This ties in to the next big opportunity as it relates to community microgrids and resilience. Uh, commercial and industrial parking lots and rooftops have a lot of untapped solar potential. The graphic you'll see here shows an industrial area near a freeway, and all of these little gray squares are actually rooftops of warehouses, office buildings, and other industrial types of facilities. These large rooftops, parking lots, and parking garages provide local center solar generation potential. An added benefit is that the electric load profiles of commercial and industrial facilities often match the peak solar production hours. 
These industrial customers also usually have utility bills with demand charges, which is a motivation to install solar and energy storage as a way of reducing monthly energy bills. Local solar can also reduce system peaks, and often industrial areas, as the one shown here, have excess feeder capacity to install large amounts of solar and energy storage without the need for expensive grid infrastructure upgrades. And finally, siting solar on top of in commercial and industrial buildings gives the ability to reduce carbon emissions from some of the heaviest polluters. In a community microgrid future, homes and buildings can all be grid partners. Well-designed and well-situated zero net energy and net positive energy buildings can become a valuable grid participant when combined with larger PV arrays on commercial and industrial structures. Individual building microgrids, such as on a critical facility, can be incorporated into a community microgrid with the appropriate hardware and software. However, it's critical to design behind the meter systems today to be compatible with future advances in energy infrastructure and how we operate our energy system. There are some advancements that have been announced by PG&E. Um, primarily the one that John referenced earlier is that of a pre-installed interconnection hub. This is a new technology that enables a mobile generation source to be interconnected to a pre-specified area of the grid during a grid outage event. It's important to note that this technology is very much still in the pilot phase. However, pg and &E is exploring this on a pilot basis for communities that are being affected by the public safety power shutoff and other similar um, necessary cuts to power. The PIH would provide power to an islandable section of the grid and develop a resilient zone. This resilient zone is essentially a basic microgrid um, with variable but limited scope. We're collaborating with PG&E to identify locations on the distribution grid where a PIH could be involved, sorry, could be installed as part of the North Bay Community Resilience Initiative. We're also working with municipalities and PG&E to enable community microgrids in resilience zones um, sometime in the future. Finally, I'd like to highlight that developing a community microgrid is really quite challenging because of the number of stakeholders that are involved and that need to have a voice at the table. As you can see here, you need the support of utilities, policymakers, municipalities, property and business owners, residents, um, as well as sources of funding from either philanthropic funders, government grants, or financiers from banks or private investment funds, and you also need solutions providers. The Clean Coalition has worked across the state and nationally to develop and design community microgrids from feasibil feasibility assessment phase through the RFP process. Utility participation is required to ensure that the resulting system is cost effective and safe. Municipalities can hold a key leadership role in, adv in advocating for safer and more reliable energy systems for their communities. Property owners, residents, and local businesses provide key feedback on critical facilities. For example, while hospitals and fire departments are obvious critical facilities, there are less obvious critical facilities that could greatly benefit from emergency backup power. Some of these could include senior centers, gas stations, and even streetlights. Now I'll pass the presentation off to John and he'll walk us through an example of a potential critical facility microgrid project in the North Bay. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, appreciate your work on that. And uh, my screen's not responding here. Josh, do I have control? You do, John. Uh, just just click on the screen of your PowerPoint. You should be all set. All right, sorry. 
Looks like it dropped me back a little bit here. Okay, so this is an example of an ideal community microgrid site within Sonoma County or potentially elsewhere. Um, ideal locations are on adjacent properties and better still if there's no public road between them due to current regulatory restrictions. In this example, there are critical, critical facility sites which would greatly enhance community safety if they're able to stay powered during grid outages, outages caused by wildfires or other events. There are also secondary sites which would be net positive energy homes or net zero energy homes, ideally also including solar and energy storage, again, adding layers of resilience to the community. The Clean Coalition performs an analysis of the existing grid infrastructure as part of a community microgrid assessment. In this example, you can see that the proposed locations are on the same grid feeder lines within a single substation area, marked in blue there. This would enable the sharing of power between these locations and make the process of interconnecting them much easier using existing grid infrastructure. As another part of the community microgrid assessment, the Clean Coalition performs a solar siting survey, which identifies the maximum solar energy potential for selected locations. In this example, you can see the individual and total solar energy capacities available by site and in total. The total capacity in this example area is over 12 megawatts, which is a lot of power. And to give you an idea of the capability, one megawatt can fully power between 700, 750 and 1,000 homes. So this example site could then power roughly up to 12,000 homes potentially. The critical infrastructure sites are essential for life safety. In this example, they include a fire station, the public works department, a water treatment plant, and a school which could be a place of refuge or an emergency shelter in the event of a disaster. Secondary sites include zero net energy microgrid ready homes and EV charging infrastructure. Some EV charging I would recommend as a critical for infrastructure as well. Molly talked about gas stations, so in the future we won't have as many gas stations, but we will need EV charging, especially as we move toward greater EV adoption as a society. Oh, remember that EVs can also be mobile generators and can power locations that might otherwise be without essential power during disaster. And that involves the vehicle to building technology that I discussed earlier. Some of the successes and wins by the Clean Coalition and the NBCRI thus far are we've developed an electrification and community microgrid ready document as a guideline for building and rebuilding. We've also de developed a draft document called Resolution for Resilient Communities that I'll discuss on the next slide. And we're in the process of developing a microgrid plan for the city of Calistoga. We are also in discussion with West and North County Communities for Resilient Microgrid Plans as they're isolated out on the ends of the grid feeders. The Resolution for Community Resilience document was drafted with the help by staff from the Center for Climate Protection. It's designed and suggested for adoption by cities and municipalities in order to state their intentions towards creating resilient communities within their jurisdiction. We are seeking connections to city and municipal decision makers for input and implementation of the document. There are no binding measures within this document. It simply states the intention for staff, intentions for staff to keep in mind while they're designing programs, codes, and standards, etc. We welcome your input to it and any connections to decision makers you might be able to provide us. In closing, we'd like to offer you some ways to stay informed and get involved. You can subscribe to the Clean Coalition newsletter, subscribe to our team partners newsletters, share information with us on potential model structure case studies, we'd be grateful for that. Uh, suggest city or municipal staff to connect with, as I discussed in the last slide, and su suggest publications to reach out to for advertising and publication of the programs and, and other people's, other partners' programs. And as I said, please suggest individuals and organizations that we can connect with. We're also seeking experts in the related fields of the NBCRI to connect with and to invite to join our Tiger team to fulfill the goals of the NBCRI. That's what we call our team is the Tiger team because we are out to go get them. 
thank you for attending and we've got some time for some questions if you'd like um, we have a contact information for myself and Malini down below and we also have three more webinars coming um, that'll be deep dives into the three main goals the first one is going to be in early April so please stay tuned to your to the website and we'll email you a notification of that first of the next three webinars we can take questions now Thank you, John. Before we take uh, some questions, uh, I, I do want to point everyone to the uh, Clean Coalition website where to access uh, this webinar when we are going to upload it and uh, past webinars. Uh, we just upgraded our website a few months ago. We're very happy with it. And if you go to the events tab at the top, look down to the left and click on webinars, you'll find our past webinars and um, let's just leave it um, I'm gonna put it back to your screen John uh, if you can leave that contact information screen up that would be great that okay you, uh, that last slide thanks there we go there we go great thank you all right so we have some questions and thank you everyone for submitting them the first one uh comes from van rainey hi van um van's from the east bay clean power alliance uh van is asking is it possible to overlay a project or community standard that goes above title 24 and would mandate community-wide application of microgrid technology that are supported by financial incentive but creates a more uniform standard for redevelopment if you need me to reread re any part of that just let me know Okay, um, I think I can speak to that. So a lot of uh, cities and municipalities are, are developing what they call reach codes, whereby they can um, specify um, electrification and uh, potentially community microgrid readiness as well. The important part of the reach code is that it cannot impose a financial burden on the on the citizens of the community. So that's sort of that's the um, that's sort of the weighing point of it. And we are actually developing a costing document that goes along with our ECMR document so that we can really demonstrate that the cost to, to implement these measures is not that great. And if it's financed into a project, really become um, insignificant. Great, thank you, John. Um, next question comes from Will Allen. William, excuse me, Will. William Allen, the founder of Huckins Energy, LLC. Um, William asks, how are the new PG&E climate charges and carbon offset charges allocated to prosumers? I'm not familiar with that. Are you, uh, Melanie, have you looked into that uh, at all? So I'm not actually familiar with how they're allocated, but I did get an email from the CPUC this morning telling me that I've received some climate credit and I'll see it on my next bill. So that's not something I could speak to in detail about how those charges are allocated, but in general, it's you know collected from our largest fossil fuel-based uh, generators and then distributed amongst each of the ratepayers in each uh, California investor-owned utility. Um, so that's the high level. Unfortunately, I don't know in detail how those uh, credits are distributed. All right. Well, if we have any more information, uh, we'll uh, we'll certainly get back to you, William. We have your email. Um, next question comes from Melanie Santiago Mosier. She's the uh, senior director of Access and Equity uh, at Boat Solar. Uh, Melanie asks, can you highlight some of the most important public policies that enable microgrids and resilience projects? Well, uh, one recent uh, development that I think is really um, pivotal is the CPUC's um, decision to allow behind the meter energy storage systems to participate in the, the uh, wholesale market. Um, I think this opens up a huge opportunity for people who have behind the meter systems, energy storage systems, and are considering them to add a new revenue stream to the, to the project. 
Um, I think that has a vast potential to increase uptake of energy storage systems. And then the important part is that as can those energy systems uh, interact with the grid or a microgrid um, and the communication protocols that are being developed and, and some of which are recommended in our ECMR document are sort of critical to that portion of the equation. Molly, do you have something to add to that? Uh, no, not at this time. I do know that there are some public policy initiatives that are in process. However, there's very few that I know of that have actually been passed. Um, but I'd be happy to follow up with you via email after the webinar. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you both. Uh, we have Mike Grant, he's a lead energy, uh, I'm sorry, lead engineer at Duke Energy. Uh, Mike asks, how do you deal with protection issues of the distribution lines when in standalone microgrid mode? So this is something that we're actively working on uh, with PG&E through a couple of pilot projects. Um, so essentially, for these community microgrids, uh, the plan is to use similar te technology to what's being developed for the pre-installed interconnection hubs. Um, however, it's not uh, fully fleshed out yet from the technical side. So the short answer is, uh, for right now, we don't know. Um, but the power engineers who are working on this project are um, definitely working to devise a solution for that. <clears throat> Josh, was that question related specifically to over overpowering um, facilities or overloading facilities, or was it, is it protection in general? Or I mean, there's a number of protocols such as you know the island capabilities, of course, that won't allow a building or a system to export uh, when the larger portion of the grid goes down. Um, and then also by virtue of the, you know, on a building scale, let's say for instance, building can only export what the main panel will handle, either coming in or going out. So I think that that helps sort of add just a sort of a natural protection to the to the system, in a sense. Yeah, Mike didn't specify, but we can certainly uh, go over it with him if we if, uh, if we have uh, a moment. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> um, we have uh, Robin Hurt. Uh, Robin is the founder of Solar Habitats in Florida. Robin asks, are you looking for examples nationwide or just California? Well, I would say definitely nationwide. I mean, we our hopes are that this this program, this effort, will expand you know, nationwide and uh, and beyond. Even you know, there's the isolated islands in the Caribbean and all over the world really need this technology and um, the whole world does. There, there are other nations working on it. As a matter of fact, Japan's really been at the forefront of developing microgrids, but national examples would be fantastic. Yes, please pass them on. Um, great, thank you. Um, Van from uh, East Bay Power Alliance has another question. Uh, Van asks, what steps are needed to replicate the community-wide grid independence that was created in West Australia? I am a little bit familiar with what's happening in Australia. So in Australia, the sections of the grid there are, are really, I think, pretty distinct and separate from each other. It's such a huge uh, country and, and really a lot of space between them. So. I am not sure about the interconnection of the different portions of the grid there, if they're completely independent or if they're interconnected. But um, that's what we are, are, are uh, believe we should move towards our microgrids that are connected to other microgrids and interconnected within, um, within regions. Um, now, Molly, would you like to add to that? Um, no, sorry, I can't speak specifically to, to anything in Australia. Um, but in general, uh, I think, you know, our energy system has been around for a long time and it hasn't evolved a lot in the last, you know, 50 to 100 years. And so what we're finding with these wildfires that have, you know, devastated 
Northern California or really all of California over the last two years is that this is serving as the impetus for major policy changes. Um, and as I mentioned with SB 901, there's a proceeding that's opened at the CPUC and I imagine this is gonna be the first of many, um, but oftentimes it takes um, you know, a massive destructive event to motivate folks to um, move things forward on the policy front and enable these types of uh, resilience projects. Great, thank you. Uh, Lane Sherman, Sharman, excuse me, from the, uh, he, uh, Lane is from the San Diego Energy District, the executive director. Lane asked, what is the assessment of the community-wide microgrid Borrego Springs implemented by sdg &E? The assessment, um, I'm a little, I'm not super familiar with it, but one of the, uh, one of our experts on our team, Halal Katmale from General Microgrids, was involved with that project. And from my understanding, it's performing um, exceptionally well. I think recently they just uh, had a little bit of a setback where they were trying to connect the a new community solar system to it, and it didn't quite work as expected. Um, but they're working the bugs out of it. And I think um, they're, they have a combination of uh, renewable energy, energy storage, and some some diesel and other um, backup systems, um, and they're moving more toward renewables. Um, being in Southern California, the, the person asking the question is probably more familiar with it than, than we are in particular, but probably other members of our team who are based in Southern California could answer to that more specifically, so that might be something we'd want to get back to them on. Great, yeah, thank you very just, much. Just to add to that quickly, uh, I think it's important to note that with um, Borrego Springs, it's uh, being operated by San Diego Gas and Electric. And so that's quite a different business model than what Clean Coalition is kind of putting forward, which is um, a vision for the future where we can have any utility customer or prosumer um, have their own microgrid. Right now, one of the challenges is identifying how each individual customer who's interested in a microgrid, how can they actually work with the utility to enable that, uh, which is a bit different than having the utility themselves own and operate microgrids. Yeah, but that's not to say that the utility couldn't, like such as uh, Green Mountain, actually take the initiative to to put energy storage in people's homes that it's an asset that the utility owns that they can then use as an ancillary asset and it's a benefit to the consumer and to the utility. So there's a, I think there's a mixing of models that's possible. I don't know exactly the specifics of what's happening in Borrego Springs if that's the case or exactly, but I'd, I'd like to look into that more personally myself. Great, thanks guys. Um, this is Rosanna Francescato. I'm the communications director with the Clean Coalition. I just wanted to follow up uh, quickly on the policy question we had earlier because I think that's a really important part of the puzzle here. And John mentioned some policies that are enabling behind the meter solutions and that's an important part of this. Um, as John and Melanie mentioned, at the Clean Coalition, we're really working hard to enable wholesale distributed generation, which is going to be a very important part of community microgrids. And we're working on a number of policies in this area. We've worked a lot on um, helping to enable interconnection for these projects, which has been really problematic and really streamlining that. And we're also working on optimized configurations for community microgrids and in addition we're, we have a value of resilience project which is really trying to place a dollar value on the resilience provided by community microgrids because that will enable the market for these types of installations everyone understands that there's a value to resilience but no one's put a dollar value on that and another really important policy initiative that we have going is the transmission access charges campaign which is in trying to 
um, really correct a huge market distortion that's happening right now with the way we charge for using the transmission grid. So that right now in, in most of California, all energy is charged to use the transmission grid, whether that energy actually uses that part of the grid or not. Now that adds, it's, it's gonna add three cents per kilowatt hour to the cost of clean local energy projects like wholesale distributed generation. That can be up to half the cost of those projects. So if we correct that market distortion, that's gonna make clean energy projects that are installed locally much more cost effective. So we have a number of uh, initiatives like this going on also with um, distribute, um, dispatchable energy. And a lot of this is on our site. If you go under policy, you can find out more about this and we'll, we'll be happy to follow up with anyone on this as well. But I wanted to make sure that we cover that because that's a big part of what we're doing and a big part of what's going to make these community microgrid projects actually feasible. Thanks, Rosanna. Yeah, and um, the other great thing about the technologies that we're discussing and implementing is that the costs keep coming down, which is phenomenal. So there's gonna come a point, actually I think we already are at that point, cost parity between renewables and traditional generation. And the technologies as they advance and, and things get streamlined, it's going to get more and more cost effective to do this as we move forward, which is exciting. All more right, thank you. Were mm -hmm. you going to say something else, John? Go I was ahead. just going to ask if there's time for any more questions, but it looks like we're pretty close. Yeah, I think we have time for, for one or two more, so why don't we go ahead. All right, so we have from uh, Michael Eisenscher. Uh, Michael is a delegate at the Alameda Labor Council Climate and Environmental Justice Caucus. Michael uh, asks, and, and let me know if you need me to repeat this. Uh, among your stakeholders, you failed to mention labor unions and their members whose work may be impacted. Any plan that fails to include them and develop a plan for a just transition will incur their opposition. Similarly, frontline communities, those most impacted by pollution and other impacts of fossil fuel dependent energy, must also participate as stakeholders and to ensure the transition is environmentally and socially just. Uh, this is more of a statement than a question, I believe, but uh, if you want to well, comment I, on that, feel yeah, free. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and really, you know, we need an army to, to create the kind of transition that needs to occur. And we're going to need the, the labor unions, we're going to need the electrical uh, union. Um, Builders, trades unions, I mean, to, to really, and this is part of our outreach is we're starting to reach out to these union organizations. So that's a super important part of the equation and it will be a just transition. There's there's a lot of work to be done and, you know, there's nobody that's better trained to do it than the unions and the union workers, really. Um, from the standpoint of fossil fuels, yes, absolutely. And I've been an advocate and I'm actually working with some people in the fossil fuel industry to try to help them transition over to from and from a fossil fuel infrastructure to a renewable energy infrastructure and a lot of uh, large oil companies are starting to do that for instance um, there's going to be some some losing industries such as the coal industry and the and the natural gas industry but again those workers are highly trained highly skilled and there's no reason that they can't with a little bit of retraining uh, be part of that transition as well Great, thanks, John. How about one more? Uh, this is from uh, Shinro Lee. Uh, Shinro uh, is uh, actually from the, um, the Chinese American Environmental Professionals Association that uh, John will be speaking at their annual event, one of their events uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, Shinro asks, rooftops and parking lots are great places to collect and treat stormwater. Has there been any discussion to potentially achieve multiple benefits, including renewable energy and uh, water quality improvements? It's not something I don't believe that the Clean Coalition, Coalition has worked on directly, but in, in my private projects, I always include water catchment systems into them. Um, and Shinro, when I come and present, I will give you an example of that um, on the project in San Francisco. I think that's a critically important part of the equation moving forward as water becomes more scarce uh, or distributes in different ways due to climate change and uh, energy and water are really, in, you know, they're tied together um, 
um, inseparable. It takes energy to produce clean water, um, and um, and therefore it's it's an important part of the equation that uh, it just kind of falls in line with. So I'll be I'll be speaking to that at the presentation and later this month or later next month. Thank you. Uh, yeah, actually April twenty seventh in the Berlin game. Right. So. We are uh, all done, and I, I appreciate everyone attending um, and submitting their questions. If we didn't get to your question, we'll be sure to uh, email you with, with some information uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, you will also receive a copy of the, uh, the webinar, a link to the webinar on our YouTube channel and, uh, and um, a uh, copy of the uh, presentation itself in a variety of formats. So uh, come back for our next webinar. As I said, you can access the schedule on clean-coalition.org and uh, sign up there. So we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.